We will get uh, started. It's about uh, five after six. Be respectful of everyone's time. This is uh, so. Normally, if you know Pete, he is not sitting down at all. So this is unusual for both of us. Usually we're up and up and about, and I'm usually trying to follow his lead. Um, but uh, on his crutches, he can't get around too too good. But he's. Uh, um, with that, uh, so I'm Sheriff Dan Starry, and I just want to say first of all, thank you all uh, for being here. Um, this is an important topic. It's a, uh, a topic that is uh, it was real, it's happening throughout the Washington County, throughout Lake Elmo, throughout uh, the metro, across the country. So thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for being here. Um, I got one question. Uh, I know that uh, today is, why didn't the Sheriff's Office um, post this out on the Sheriff's Office Facebook page. And the reason for that is we wanted this for the Lake Elmo citizens. And that's why this is a city function. The city asked us to be down here. And if we would have posted it out on Facebook, we would have had Forest Lake, Cottage Grove, etc. We really, Pete and I really wanted this to be, and the city really wanted this to be about Lake Elmo. And that's why we didn't post it that way. Um, otherwise, we would have had a lot more. Um, but I know the I know the city, the city officials, the council. I know that they were uh, posting it. I know I saw it on uh, uh, Council Member McGinn's uh, Facebook. So thank you for that, and the city and stuff. So um, thank you, and thank you to the uh, city of Lake Elmo Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for having us uh, here this evening. It, it it does mean a lot. Um, like I said, I'm Sheriff Dan Starry. Uh, I've been sheriff since 2017, and I am going to uh, be going, I hit my 29th year here in Washington County um, in July. And I'm, I, this, is, this is my first law enforcement job. I came up and through the ranks uh, patrolling the streets of Lake Elmo, Montemedi, Forest Lake, all the way through. So there's nothing that I really don't know what's occurring in Lake Elmo or throughout the county. Um, like I said, uh, my, my family's here, I live here, um, my two daughters live here as well, and, um, and with that, uh, we've, we've uh, come to, to love this area very much, and we care about this. And I just want to say thank you for showing up tonight, because that's the first step. That means that you care about our community. And so thank you for that. Pete? Yeah, if I, could, if I could just add, I'm Pete Orpin, I'm the county attorney. Um, sorry about the crutches, I tell you, you know, we worry about things going on. We worry about getting carjacked and stuff. What I worry about is slipping and falling on ice. I ended up breaking my pelvis in a couple of places. And then getting in here on that terrazzo floor is like running on a hockey rink. But uh, what I was so excited about when given this opportunity is prior to COVID, which really, it, for us, came around in March of 2020 when we all had to go to lockdown and a lot of folks working from home, et cetera. Uh, and by the way, my office made it through without one casualty, and I just can't believe how lucky we are because we deal with a lot of the public. But prior to that, Dan and I had gone out doing a lot of crime prevention talks, uh, primarily going to seniors because they are targets for fraud, uh, identity theft presentations, uh, talk about juvenile sex trafficking, which is still a terrible scourge. We don't read much about it now because there's other news, but it's there. Well, ever since March, Dan and I haven't had that opportunity. So when we were uh, asked to do this, I think we both got really excited because this is what it's about, meeting with you folks, uh, learning what your concerns are, telling you what we're doing to address those concerns. And, and for me, the goal is I hope you'll leave tonight being somewhat assuaged in your fear and anger, okay? Because if you keep reading the paper like we all do, you start to think, what's happening? The wheels are coming off this thing. It's crazy. It's nuts. I can't even go to Cub Foods without worrying about somebody carjacking me. Yeah, those anecdotes are there. And, and, and we are responding, by the way, and we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that. But uh, I think we're in control. I, I, I think out in this county, I've never worked with such professionals as Dan and his staff. And I see we've got some of our deputies, Tim and Dana and some others back here. And I want to introduce you to Laura Perkins. Laura's our most recent hire. Dan and I combined and hired Laura, who's a former law enforcement officer, and her dad was a longtime prosecutor. 
she's uh, our community outreach person. And I told her, well, now that we're hiring you, get us out there, even though it's hard to do with the COVID and these and stuff. But she's going to be really helpful to us in getting out and having more of these meetings with you folks and hearing your concerns and trying to respond to those concerns. Uh, like Dan said, you know, I live in this community. I have two daughters that live in Lake Elmo. I've got, uh, where's Kevin Magnuson? Kevin, stand up, please. Kevin Magnuson's one of my senior attorneys. He's been living in Lake Elmo, I think, since he was a kid. He bought his dad's house right on the lake. Uh, so we've got strong ties to this community, and it's a wonderful place, and I'll be darned if I'm going to let it get crazy. It's not going to happen. Uh, but what I do want to talk later about after Dan goes, I want to talk about what we're doing in response to what you're seeing. Uh, and then i got to give it to you, some of the hard things that are going on now and the difficult things that have made my life pretty stressful and the lives of my, uh, my staff stressful, but we'll get to that. And then how are we going to work our way out? So I hope by the end of the evening you'll feel you've been heard uh, and you've been understood and we get it and we're responding. That's probably as good as it gets. So thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, like I said, so the program this evening, we started a little after 6. We'll get down just about 7 o'clock. I know that the school is, is wishing that uh, we get out by 7.30. But we will stick around for uh, questions as long as it takes, because that's why we're here, right? And so we'll do that. Um, first of all, I'm just going to give a high-level uh, snapshot of the Sheriff's Office. A lot of people don't know what the sheriff's office does, right? And so the sheriff's office, um, we like to say that we're a large agency with a small agency feel. And what I mean by that is that you get the full extent of the sheriff's office when you contract with the, with the sheriff's office, which the city of Lake Elmo does. The sheriff's office, we have 270 uh, employees and um, they are dedicated, they serve with pride, and uh, they do an outstanding job every day. Our patrol unit has uh, over 60 uh, sworn deputies, including six canines, um, and that they meet, uh, and also they, we serve 22 cities and townships. And so that is main services. Obviously, uh, Oakdale, Woodbury, et cetera, they have their own police departments. We assist with them. However, that is not our main service. Our main service is such as Lake Elmo. Um, so we have 22 cities and townships throughout Washington County that, uh, that we serve uh, um, directly. Uh, with that, uh, we continue to be engaged uh, through proactive outreach, education, enforcement, and being uh, responsive to our citizens uh, every day. In 2020, I created a special enforcement team. Uh, this team was specifically to address concerns brought, us to, brought it to us by our citizens. The county sends out a survey uh, every two years about what are your fears? What are you seeing? Uh, please respond to that. That'll be coming out again, uh, coming up next year or this year. Uh, please respond to that because that really helps us throughout the county um, dedicate our uh, services and it really tells the county board what you guys are looking for and we can go and ask for that and they're very responsive uh, to that. So we, we set up the special enforcement team. Uh, and really that was to combat uh, what we saw out on the roads, the speeding, the DWIs, uh, the unsafe driving. We still have all of that, but now we also have stolen vehicles, fleeing vehicles, um, and protection of our neighborhoods, uh, which uh, the special enforcement team has, called in, has been called into action uh, numerous times here in Lake Elmo, making sure uh, if, if anyone uh, lives out near Quick Trip, um, they're sitting out there, they're patrolling, um, sometimes they're in bark squads, sometimes uh, they're in trucks, um, sometimes they're in uh, regular uh, vehicles. Um, I myself, I've been out there numerous times. Um, whether it's up near the airport, up near uh, our neighborhoods, uh, uh, up near the, uh, the uh, elementary school, etc., cetera, um, all over. So, I mean, it, it's uh, all hands on deck when it comes to less. Uh, type of stuff just to, to try to uh, suppress it. Um, we also created a, a co-response unit. Uh, this, res this, uh, this is for to address mental health uh, needs. Last year in Lake Elmo alone we had 78 service calls uh, directly dealing with those with mental health 
and crisis calls in Lake Elmo. That doesn't include any of the other 22 cities um, that we directly uh, uh, patrol. And so that's, that's quite a few, but this unit has uh, just been outstanding. We have our general uh, investigations unit as well. Uh, they, they do primarily uh, felony level crimes, including homicides, assaults, burglaries, thefts. Uh, I also created a special investigations unit. Uh, Lee Bloomquist over here uh, is part of that, uh, that group, and they, they really track in on what's going on in our local areas. Um, a lot of times our patrol people are going from call to call to call, and there's not enough time in the day to sit and really figure out how do we address this. And that's where the Special Investigations Unit and the Special Enforcement Teams really uh, come into. We have, this is probably the longest I have not heard Pete talk. <laughs> I, I, I am just saying. Well, I always have something to say, but it's just so fun to see people out. Yeah, it is. That you care about your community, and I'm so grateful to see it. Some of the, some of the other things that we have is our drug task force, right? I mean, um, we, we really go after here. Um, believe it or not, methamphetamine and, and fentanyl, they're, they're king in Washington County. They're king within Minnesota. We are a destination hub for the Mexican cartels, believe it or not. If you have not read that, if you don't know that, Minnesota, the Twin Cities, is a hub for that. And every day, we are working on drug trafficking organizations through HIDA that affect the flow of narcotics in and out of Minnesota and the monies and proceeds with that. Um, HIDA is uh, high intensive. It's the North Central High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. I'm the, uh, I'm the chair. Uh, for us, it's uh, for Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we cover those two states uh, through the federal government. So we, we get money, uh, uh, the two states do, to fight this and uh, to fight the trafficking, and uh, we've done an exceptional job with that, uh, along with uh, Pete's team and the prosecution list. Uh, we also uh, uh, have sex trafficking as well, right? I mean. That's one of the things that uh, human trafficking, labor trafficking, uh, sexual uh, exploitation, that's another focus of our task forces, uh, that they, they're up in Pete's office, but it's Oakdale, Woodbury, and uh, the Sheriff's office, along with uh, Homeland Security and then T Pete's team. Uh, outstanding work that they do day in and day out in trying to uh, break that uh, cycle of sex trafficking uh, for these individuals that get caught up in it. In-house computer forensics uh, that we have. Uh, we also have two crime analysts. We have one over here as well, Blake. Uh, Blake. And uh, Blake is uh, one of the two, but everything that we do these days, right, involves cell phones. Especially, especially with these uh, stolen vehicles, a lot of these individuals go out on social media and they take photos of themselves with these fancy new cars that they just committed a crime with. These guys are the ones that go out there, they find it, and they make those cases stick as well. We can't do our jobs without them. Cell phones, computers, all of that. Uh, our crime analysts, we have two of them, like I said. Uh, we have both of them work uh, in Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And uh, so our partners all the way across the metro were, were pretty linked in with St. Paul, Ramsey, Minneapolis, Hennepin, but Anoka, Dakota, et cetera, as well. Um, with that, uh, we have special weapons and tactics. We have our mobile field force teams. Um, we have our school resource officer uh, as well that is housed right here at Oakland Middle School. We also have one at the Montemita High School. They do a tremendous job uh, with our youth, making sure that they stay out of trouble as well. And if they need help, they're here. But we assist the school district 834 and 832 uh, on a regular basis with that. Uh, and they do an awesome job with that. Um, with that, um, in the back you have Sergeant Erickson. Um, if you want to give a wave, she is, a, uh, she is our uh, sergeant that uh, serves here in, in Lake Elmo. I also have my chief deputy, um, Doug Anschutz. He lives in Woodbury. And then we have uh, the team that serves here directly, our deputies, uh, Ostertag, Limpong, Jarring, Papke, Maloney, and Graham. 
and uh, every day they do, they're here, they work hard, and they serve you as citizens. So here we go. Why are we here? We're here to discuss crime prevention and uh, lessen your chances of being a victim. Certainly we know, and like Pete said, you turn on the radio, you turn on the TV, you can't pick up newspaper or social media about the crime rising in this area or throughout the metro or the country, uh, frankly. And that's why we're here. Um, these crimes are occurring all day long. There is not a specific time that these type of crimes are occurring. And a lot of people will say, well, it's only during these hours. It doesn't. We have seen it throughout the day. Sundays, Mondays, Fridays, uh, every day of the week as well. Some of the challenges that uh, we do see is a lot of these are being committed by juveniles. The youngest that we have caught here recently was 11 years old. We just caught four juveniles down in the Lakeland area two nights ago in a stolen vehicle going through uh, vehicles. All four of them were 15 years old, none of them from Washington County. Um, they are now at Lionel Lakes uh, in secure uh, detention there. Um, but with the, with the juveniles, they also flee. They have no fear whatsoever. And they know our tactics. They know that if they go down the highway in the wrong lane, that agencies throughout the state, the country, will probably back off because they don't want to see uh, a family get injured or killed. They know that. They do that deliberately um, yeah, and stuff. We have called on uh, Colonel Langer of the State Patrol uh, for his assistance um, with the helicopter and, and uh, plane, and they are up a lot. And uh, it, it helps tremendously because we can back off, they can follow up, uh, and then we can uh, arrest them at that time and get our, our units uh, together. Some of the numbers here in Lake Elmo, and I know there's a lot of stuff out on social media, uh, and I would say be cautious of that. It's nice to share the information, um, but be cautious uh, as well. Here in Lake Elmo, we saw 20 stolen or unauthorized use of motor vehicles in 2021. Now that is uh, up by one. We had 19 in 2020. Um, of those, 12 vehicles had their vehicles left in it. Three vehicles were running, and 13 out of the 20 were unlocked. We saw one carjacking here in the city of Lake Elmo, and that was in the area of Cimarron. And I know that made social media, et cetera, and, and the news for that. Uh, but we've had one carjacking. Certainly we've, we've heard about it in Woodbury, and we've also heard about it in Oakdale. We do have a task force that we are working with their detectives and their agencies as well. Um, one of the, the, the cool things, as soon as there's a stolen car, if it's cool, that is for me, um, that everyone gets, there's an app, St. Paul, Ramsey, us, gets a, a notification on our phone says where the stolen vehicle it is or was, if there's anyone following it, and everyone can sort of converge in that area to locate uh, those individuals. Um, so some of the crime prevention tips that, uh, I mean, these are pretty simple. And I think uh, we know this every, you know, from the time we were little, right? Don't leave your keys in your car. Don't leave your key fob in the car. Don't leave your cars running. Um, we just had one uh, two days ago, yesterday, two days ago, and quick trip uh, out near Inwood. Uh, he was there, left his car running. Um, there was an individual that was uh, hanging around the gas pump and he, he took it uh, and went with it. So please, don't leave your car running. Keep your keys. Put down your garage doors. Um, doesn't matter if it's daytime. Does not matter if it's nighttime. Please put down your garage doors. If you go through the Eastern Village or any of, any of the residential areas, you will see garage doors left open. Please put them down. It's a crime of opportunity, and if we take away that opportunity, we can solve or at least uh, stop some of these uh, crimes from, from occurring. Um, with that being said, um, I, this is like, I, I figure I got an hour. <laughs> <laughs>
I just, I, so whenever you want me to jump. I know. I got a lot. So catalytic converted uh, theft, that's another thing, right, that we all hear about. In um, Lake Elmo last year, we had 23 reports of catalytic uh, converter theft. Six of them were in the month of September. That was our highest month. Um, but otherwise, every other month, uh, the, the summer, it sort of went down in July and August. But then, for whatever reason, it, it, it rose in September. Um, we have been catching them, um, but we, we are calling uh, on our state legislatures for help with that as well, because that's got to stop. Where they take them to get money, that has to stop. Um, since we're a, a bordering uh, state, uh, a lot of them will go there, a lot of them will go uh, south of uh, our state as well. So, but 23 over the, uh, the course of the year. Um, residential burglaries and commercial burglaries, last year in Lake Elmo we had 23 uh, all year long. 18 residential. Now this could include a, a bicycle taken from, from a, a garage that is uh, attached to the house as well. Um, but 18 residential, so 23 all together. In 20, we had, in 2020, we had 20. And in 2019, we actually had 26. Um, so actually in 2019, we were higher. So with that, what it, why I, I give you some of these statistics, it seems like, it, it seems like it's occurring all the time, every day, right? We're out here, we have a great team um, that are out here serving uh, the city of Lake Elmo. And we will continue to be out here. We'll continue to provide extra enforcement. Uh, we have, like I said, analytics, everything else that we continue to watch. Uh, and we have been very successful in catching these youths that are stealing these cars. And I want people to know that. On the back end, I know Pete's gonna be talking about what we're also doing as far as prosecution side, because my gosh, that's what you all hear about, right? Is nothing's being done to these juveniles. And, and I know Pete's going to uh, be talking about that. So with that, tips for uh, preventing uh, burglary. Keep expensive stuff out of, uh, out of sight, right? Just, just don't have it. Purses, uh, anything valuable, uh, keep them out of sight. Again, shut, your, shut the garage door. Consider a security system. They do work, they let us know, and we get there in a timely manner. Um, invest in lighting. These are, um, if it's at night, light it, put on your lights. Uh, make sure that it's not blocked by overgrown brush or trees or things like that. Light up your driveway. Um, ditch the spare key. Believe it or not, the rock, the fake rock that's in your front yard or the key that's behind the, the fence that we may hang, or the flower pot that's stuck under that, or the mat, that the front mat, they know all of this stuff, and they will look for it. Ditch the spare key. Um, most of us have garage door codes, use that. Uh, travel, uh, some, just some quick tips uh, to keep uh, you safe. Uh, when you're gone, call the sheriff's office. Please call the sheriff's office. Let us know that you're going to be gone. We can give extra patrol. We have a uh, reserve. Uh, um, we have reserves that they'll go out along with our patrols. We'll write that down, and we will periodically check on your house. If we see something suspicious, we have your contact information or a contact information uh, of whoever you choose that we can call. Snow and lawn care. Our burglars that are out here recently uh, throughout the county, they have been targeting those homes that have non-plowed or non-shoveled driveways because they know no one's home and haven't been home since the last snowfall. So please have someone, even, even driving their car up into the driveway back and forth a few times, will usually stop that, right? They'll go on to the next one that doesn't have any snow, uh, um, or any marks in the snow. Automatic lights, if there's any movement, it, you know, out here in Lake Elmo we have a lot of deer and turkeys and things like that. Um, it's sort of neat to see that as well, right? So make sure you have automatic lights. Uh, vehicles, um, again, uh, a spare vehicle, have them park in your driveway, etc., like that, but making marks, uh, especially this time of the year, 
is really uh, important. And social media, please do not post your cruise photos. Do not put that you're at the airport waiting on a, on a plane to go to Cancun because people see that and they target that. What a great way to tell the whole world, hey, we're not home. Come in, break into the house. Um, neighborhood Watch, we have uh, Deputy Darren Ostertag. He is our uh, crime prevention specialist right here in Lake Elmo. Um, if you need to get a hold of him, the uh, email is up there, darren.ostertag at co.washington.mn.us. He is the guy who is responsible for um, crime prevention here in the city of Lake Elmo. He will set up uh, neighborhood watch groups if you want to do that. I know that we have six going uh, currently in Lake Elmo, and thank you for those six uh, communities that are doing that, but we can do more. Please, please, please uh, give him a call. When in doubt, call 911. 651-439-9381, that is our non-emergency line. If there's something suspicious or if you want to get a hold of us, call 911. 911 is answered by our communication staff and it's the same person answering your call. The only question that they will have is, is this an emergency? If it's not, that's okay, say no. If they're on, on with someone that's having an emergency, they'll put you on hold. Uh, but please, call 911, please, please, please. We've always been taught not to, right? But call 911. We're out here 24 seven. Uh, if you see something suspicious, something that doesn't look right, call us, please, please. Um, the the uh, report in Lake Elmo, or uh, in Lakeland the other night, that was by a citizen saying, hey, there's someone in my driveway. Can you come down and check them out? Then a short pursuit occurred, they crashed, the four fled, we caught the four. That, that night and the next day, we got quite a few car break-ins. Most of them were all unlocked and they were rummaging through their vehicles. But it, again, this was later on, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Um, so please, if you see something, we're out here. Your Lake Elmo deputy is on at two o'clock in the morning, please call. It doesn't hurt um, to give us a call. So with that, I've uh, used up a half an hour piece. And uh, it's yours. I won't take long, Dan, but thank you very much for that. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I'm just finishing up my third term, third term as county attorney. Uh, but before that, I ran a, a, a robbery prosecution task force in Hennepin County, where we were very, very busy. So when it comes to robberies, um, I actually get excited to, to handle those cases because uh, they're very scary. And, uh, and being a victim of a robbery where someone uses a gun or a knife to take your property can really do a number on you. And uh, I feel duty bound to do a number on the person that did that to you. And I don't mind if I do. Uh, let me just try to encapsulate what I've seen in the last couple of years. Of course, like I said, in March 2020, COVID hit. And, and you know, we were doing okay, although they shut the courts down. It, they were having virtual hearings on Zoom, but not many, and that started a backlog, which I want to talk about in a little bit, about how big it's gotten. Uh, but that started, and then the big one for me was when George Floyd was uh, murdered. It seemed like everything started to get crazy, and uh, from my perspective, you know, uh, not, not just how they burned half of Minneapolis down that day, but then for several days, as well as out here. Although we've got, Dan talked about a mobile field force. We've got cops ready to go on buses, ready to respond wherever it is. I, I've never seen anything like the alacrity these folks have when it gets to get on top of that stuff. But what happened was, in my view, I've never seen such brazen crimes occurring in my, in my 35 years doing this. I, it's just, I, we, I've always had a steady diet of homicides and robberies and rapes and that, but nothing at the level that I'm seeing now. And I attribute it to a lot of young people 
They watched and saw how a police department building in Minneapolis got burned to the ground, and they thought, well, I wonder if I can get away with that. And there's a level of impunity where these young people, they don't care. They just don't care what the consequences are. And they're going around, like I said earlier, sticking somebody up for their groceries at Cub Foods. Uh, we had one where a guy went to Oakdale, uh, stole a car from a gas pump because, you know, you leave it on, you want to warm your car up, you go in for a cup of coffee, that car's gone, along with your purse or anything else you got in there. Uh, he stole that. He drove about two miles and he sees a woman in a Jaguar pulling into a store. He goes, well, that's a nicer car than the one I stole. I'll go over there, pull out a gun and take it from her. And then here we go, like Dan said. Then you get into a high-speed chase and somebody's getting hurt. So before Floyd, if I may, we get about maybe one homicide a year, not many more than that, maybe two, but typically it's about one a year. Uh, after Floyd, I counted eight in my office, eight murders. And uh, I've never seen anything like that here. Uh, and so uh, I grabbed one, several of my other prosecutors grabbed one. I've got 10 prosecutors in my criminal division. I've got six in my juvenile division. Uh, we've talked a little bit more about that, but uh, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Now, we can throw our hands up in the air and say I'm powerless, there's nothing I can do about it, uh, but that's not how I operate. Now, part of my problem is a couple of my colleagues in the metro area, they determined that their response to dealing with the Floyd case is to do so-called reform. Now, I'm all about trying to do better, you know, taking my inventory, what can I do better? Uh, so it's not that necessarily, but this idea of reform is we have to lighten up on holding people to account. And while they're saying that, I'm saying absolutely not. If I'm not held to account, I might do whatever I damn well please. And that's what we're seeing now. And so some of my colleagues decided, well, we're not going to do this class of crimes. We're not going to prosecute drug cases. We're not going to send any juveniles into a lockup. We're done doing that. And I'm going, well, I'm not. And, and I've got a couple of anecdotes that, that can put it into frame for you. Now, I'm not out to collect scalps. That's not what we do as prosecutors. We're there to firmly hold people to account in a fair way for what they did. And it invariably involves punishment. It involves restitution to my victims. And I tell my prosecutors, you don't need to be troubled about this young kid doing something crazy. You need to focus on the victims. They're the ones that got ripped off. They're the ones that have been damaged. And we've got to protect them. Now, I can't undo the crime, but I can hold the perpetrator to account in a fair, firm, but a way they can promise you they know it's coming. And I don't think they know it's coming over in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I, I really don't. Let me just, here's an example. Two weeks ago, we got a kid stealing a car, a kid, a, a young adult stealing a car. And, and Dan's group nailed him, after a flea, of course, uh, nailed him. He comes to court. He had 18 prior auto thefts. 18. And he's a 17-year-old kid. And the judge looks at him and says, have you ever done any time in a juvenile lockup, like overnight? No, uh-uh. No, never. Uh, well, that should, that's over. <laughs> um, and he's currently sitting down in Red Wing, our juvenile prison there. He's doing a year down there. Uh, had another one last week. Seven prior uh, convictions. 16-year-old uh, kid for aggravated robbery. That's where they take your car with a gun pointed at your head or worse, maybe shoot you. Seven priors, not one of them convicted because the courts kept saying, well, this kid's incompetent. He's not incompetent to steal my car. <laughs> He's real competent at doing that. I think he can sit in a courtroom while I run a steamroller over him. I, and I mean that. I mean, the, the, that kind of impunity, they go, well, why don't I just do whatever I want? Nothing's going to happen to me. And we hear it all the time from the juveniles. Well, my juvenile team has been responding real hard. Now, Traditionally, for many, many years, the way juvenile crimes work is, uh, well, in my office, we handle all juvenile crimes, misdemeanors, felonies, but for my adult prosecution unit, we only handle felonies. We don't do the misdemeanors. Those go to your city attorney. But the juveniles, they get them all. But at any rate, when we get someone from out of our county, we'll convict them, have a trial or something, and uh, 
We'll convict them, and after we convict them, we send them back to the home county to be sentenced. Well, after we've had a number of these cases, and I mean a big number of them, coming through, and they all seem to be juveniles from outside our county, and I said, well, we're not sending them back for sentencing because they aren't getting sentenced. And I said, we're going to keep them here. Well, that means uh, we have to supervise them, and it means more resources. And I went to our community corrections and said, I don't want to bury you guys. We're all real busy. But I'm not sending them back to Ramsey County to have somebody apologize to them for the inconvenience of bringing them to court. That's not going to happen. I think, and after 35 years doing this, most criminals on some level have some idea about risk benefit. You know, if it's low risk, high benefit, they're going to do it. They're going to steal it. They're going to rip you off. But if it's high risk, some don't. Some go out, I'll, I'll do something easier, like do package and mail theft. Another thing that sets my hair on fire. Uh, and thank God there's uh, ring doorbells have been helpful, but at, at every Christmas. I get them following UPS trucks, you know, and when we get our hands on them, it can be very, very frustrating. For one, some of our judges, they take this reform view of, oh, well, it's only a low-level property crime. And I go, I don't, I don't understand what those words mean. Uh, Low-level property crime? Uh, you know, uh, so I don't buy into that. Uh, but we get a lot of those. Like Dan said, the catalytic converter thefts, you know, there's some precious metal in those things. Uh, but when you lose one, when you have some kid climb under your car with a cordless sawzall and take that thing, stand by. You're going to get a bill for up to 3000 bucks to replace it, and it's going to take weeks. And it's driving me crazy. And I've talked to my legislators here in the county saying, you got to do something about it. It's, we catch, we have caught several uh, in the act of stealing them. Uh, but the accountability isn't quite there. You know, because the judge will go, well, that's a one-time felony theft, and, and after all, the thing's only worth like eight or 900 bucks, not to you and me, when you get it replaced. Uh, and they don't really treat it as hard as they think they ought. And it's, and it's really vexatious, and they're hard to get these guys. But if you remember about uh, during the recession, copper thefts, they were stealing wires, they're still doing that, stealing streetlight wires, but they were stealing plumbing out of people's homes, the copper pipes and that. And the only way we could respond was getting a law to make the junk dealers who buy that stuff held to account. So I might not be able to get the thief, but if some guy's buying it from the thief, he owes me for that theft. And I'm trying to get the legislature to go, I know, City of St. Paul had a thing where they make uh, possession of a catalytic converter a misdemeanor. Ah, uh, no, uh-uh, that's not a misdemeanor. I want that to be a high severity felony. And, uh, we had one where a guy had a pickup truck. The whole back of it was full of catalytic converters. He said, well, you know, I just go around, I sell these to auto shops. No, you don't. Those are all stolen, every damn one of them. Well, how do you prove it, you know? And I, and I want the law to say, if you possess it, you putatively have to have known it was stolen. I mean, I saw it on both ends. You didn't buy that at uh, Napa. And so we got to get on top of things like that. Um, on the plus side, now, there aren't any pluses in my job, but uh, Dan talked a little bit about how do we respond to the mentally ill. A number of them end up in our jails. Why is that? Well, there are no state hospitals. There is nowhere to send somebody in crisis. It's incredibly difficult to get a bed. If you're lucky, you'll get on to Regents, and you'll only be there for a very short time, and they put you back out. And when we civilly commit people because they're a danger to themselves or others, there's no state hospital to put them. And so what do they do? They end up in the default place of jail, you know? And uh, Dan and I teamed up and said, you know, cops aren't social workers. I'm not a good social worker. I'm a better prosecutor. Uh, I don't know how to deal with these folks, but there are people who do know how. And so we've got them embedded in with our cops, right there in it. They can respond right away. They know where to go. So we've, got, we've really worked hard on getting the mentally ill out of our jail. Dan talked about drugs. I don't even know what to say. It, it, it's, it's just been awful. Uh, last year and the year before, we yet again set uh, overdose deaths records for the county and the state and the country. Uh, but I worry about my county. And that's because of the fentanyl that comes in 
And I'm really working hard to keep the stigma off those who end up, unfortunately, falling down a rabbit hole of addiction. I've done a lot of research on it uh, because I needed to learn what's going on here and how did this happen. I mean, it's been an exponential, the number of overdose and overdose deaths. And by the way, every one of these cops here has Narcan, and I'll bet you half of them have saved somebody's life. And I, I just think it's phenomenal the work the, uh, we're doing. But I also feel like it's overwhelming. Well, we teamed up and decided to come up with an opioid response. And we brought in Hazelden to teach us and our staff and our prosecutors and cops, teach us what is this. And a lot of what we learned was about 90% of those who get addicted to opioids got that way through a doctor's prescription. Now, they stopped that nonsense about four or five years ago, especially when we filed a lawsuit. We were the first county in the state to file a lawsuit against the manufacturers and distributors. I just learned a week ago that we're going to get a settlement. Uh, once we filed our suit, 30 other counties and five Indian reservations in the state joined us. Uh, I didn't really want to be alone, but we, we were going to take it alone. And then uh, our, a bunch of them joined us. And we sued them for the fraud that they committed upon family doctors, telling them this stuff is it's non-addictive, all that nonsense, which led doctors to write a script. You know, I, get a tooth pulled and they give me 30 Vicodin. I go, what the heck? Uh, what's funny is, you know, I broke my pelvis and to play, you want some opioids? You don't have enough, doc. You do not have enough opioids. I'll, I'll accept the pain. But it left us with a lot of people who end up getting disordered by getting addicted to opioids. And what are we gonna do about it? Invariably, invariably, the young people that get addicted to opioids and meth, which is just a curse, end up going and committing shopliftings, and we get tons of felony shoplift. Felony shoplift means you've got to go to Walmart and steal at least a thousand bucks worth of stuff. I must get 400 a year. And um, almost invariably, those that are doing the shopliftings, the mail theft, the ID theft, every single one that Dan arrests also is in possession of either meth or heroin, or fentanyl, which is heroin times 10. And we're thinking, how do we address this? Well, why don't we go to the addiction and see what we can do about that? And let's start in our own jail, where these folks get arrested, go into the jail, go through withdrawal, they might spend 20, 30 days there, maybe less. The minute they get out, what do they do? They go back to get high again, but this time their tolerance won't weigh down because they haven't been feeding it every day, and then they die on us. And when they die on us, I have a standing rule that when we go to a call where somebody's dead and it's obvious from a drug overdose, we treat it like a homicide. Because I, don't, I want to know where that person got those drugs. Because the guy or gal that's selling them owes me for that death. And so we treat everyone like a homicide. And we've been very successful in holding people to account. My office has done more, and that's called third degree murder when you uh, provide drugs to somebody and it kills them. Uh, and my office has done more than anybody else in the state. Why? Because I'm trying to get back to that risk-benefit calculation. If drug dealers think they can sell heroin and fentanyl and meth with impunity, they will. But if they think, well, now, wait a minute, though. I know if I do it out in Washington County, it's pretty much a guarantee that Orpit's going to grab my pant leg and he ain't going to let go until I go down. And that's how we're doing. Now, is it working? I don't know. I, I won't stand by and do nothing. That I won't do. Um, and I've got the most committed professionals in the world. I can't believe the folks we managed to put together in my office. I keep telling them, they look like the 1927 Yankees lineup. I mean, some of this, I've got them. People have come from Hennepin, Ramsey, Anoka. Uh, we've been a real go-to office because uh, we let them know. Hold people to account and do it right. Do the right thing. Be fair about it. Uh, but we really do need to focus on our victims, and a lot of people respond to that and go, that's exactly how they want to prosecute. So that's what we're doing. In juvenile, we've had so many of these young people coming through. I, you know, typically, if we go back, typically, I have to go back two years, about half of our juvenile crimes, shoplifting, it's the, you know, things like that, we send them, we don't even prosecute them, we send them right to the Youth Service Bureau who has a juvenile intervention team. And of those people that go, 
86% never come back. And if I could replicate that in adult court, I'd get a Nobel Prize. So we've really done a nice job teaming up Dan and I with Youth Service Bureau. They really know how to work with kids. Those are the knucklehead kids, the kids like I was when I was a kid. They do dumb knucklehead kid stuff. Then you've got the kids who go, I'm just going to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and nobody's going to do anything about it because I'm a juvenile. And so I'm just going to go shoot and break into homes and do stuff and rape people and that and kill people. Uh-uh, no, that's not going to happen here. And my prosecutors are very good at sorting out the knucklehead kid from the brazen thug uh, ripoff artist. And those folks, we're going to hammer them. And the other kids, we go, don't do it again. Uh, truancy, we've had one of the best truancy programs I put together in the state. You know, and everybody did distance learning. I've got a full-time prosecutor. All she does is make sure these kids are in school. Because that's one step. If you drop out of school, or you're not going, say you just blow off school, what are you doing? What are they doing? Where are they? Well, you're at work. I'm at work. Are they home? Are they at their buddy's house? Are they smoking weed in the garage? What are they doing? And so I, I go, if they're not in school, I want to know why they're not and where they are. And I insist that every kid graduate from high school. And if I got to chase them around the room to do it, and I have, uh, I'll do it. Because if you don't graduate, you're on one step closer to making a living going to Greystone College down in Stillwater there. And I don't want to see that happen. So uh, truancy's gotten set back because of distance learning. It's been really next to impossible. But uh, Betsy Herb is from my office. When she finds out these guys aren't turning their computer on, she'll go knock on their door. Or turn that damn idiot box on. You're going to go to class. And we get the parents involved and that kind of thing. So we're trying to respond in, I think, a real fair and even-handed way and also let the world know that you can't misbehave and, and get away with it and just be unaccountable to it. You just can't. And um, so it's now, the bummer for me is, like when I said in March of 2020, they virtually shut down the courts. I mean, it went to a slow trickle. And since then, there have been very, very few jury trials. And the backlog is just about breaking my office. And, and I, the reason why my eyes are red is because I don't sleep because I lie in bed and I worry about it. And to put it into perspective, the National District Attorneys Association, I'm one of their vice presidents on their board, they, they recommend a prosecutor with a felony load, not misdemeanors, should have about 150 files a year, 150 cases. You can manage your victims, you can manage your trials. Uh, and we try to stay somewhere around there, buck 75, some up to 200 files. But right now, they're all hovering at 350 to 400. And I tell you, I go in my attorney's offices and I look at the shelves and go, this is going to take us forever to dig through this. And the courts still haven't opened up. In the last two months, we've been able to try three jury trials. I've got them stacked up. It, it looks like O'Hare Airport trying to land. I've got so many cases ready to go to trial, and I can't get in a courtroom. So the, of the three, they were all three were auto thefts, and and two with a fleeing. Uh, one was two and a half years old. Another one was two years old. I, you know, I've got these homicides that are going to take precedence. I sure hope so. And I've got those stacked up, ready to go, and we're ready. Uh, but it's been just, as soon as I thought this summer, well, COVID's going away, let's ramp up. Hopefully we can do night court, weekend court, whatever it takes to get through this. And then, of course, we're back at it again and everything's shut down again. I don't know. It, it, um, I think justice is best served when it's done swiftly. And my frustration is it's not. And you report a crime, Dan investigates it, he gives it to me, I prosecute it. And then you might wait a year and a half, and I will not blame you if you go, the system just seems to be nonsense. It's gotta be broken. It takes a year and a half, two years to get some punk kid held to accountable for breaking in my house? Yeah, it does now. And, uh, and my greatest fear is these cases are gonna get so old, victims are gonna not wanna come in. They're gonna go, hey, look, I got my car back. This was a couple years ago. I'm not missing work. Screw it. No accountability for the bad guys. Um, I've had those happen. I've screamed and begged the district courts going, you've got to make this more accessible. 
uh, but you know, falls on deaf ears sometimes. But those are the things that keep me up at night. Your safety, my kids' safety. Like I say, I got two daughters who live off Keats. Uh, I got a grand, granddaughter here. I got a couple in Woodbury. They need to be safe. We all do. I'm just so glad people in the community want to come out and talk about it. I really am. I feel kind of lonely going, Dan, are we the only ones feeling how crazy this is? But, uh, and I don't want you to get angry and afraid. It, it's easy to do. Uh, on the way here, just before Dan picked me up, I'm reading about uh, a case where a kid broke into a home in the middle of the morning, shot the guy's dog and took his rifle and stuff. I mean, that always had happened. But I mean, today you read it and you go, my God, the wheels are coming off. I mean, it's everywhere, you know. And I want to assure you that nothing, nothing has changed with the way we approach the investigation and prosecution of cases. Nothing's changed. In fact, we've had one of our busiest years in human trafficking. That didn't go away. You quit reading about it in the paper, but it did go away. And uh, COVID just made it morph into other things, you know. Uh, and yet, we've been, we're going to keep going the way we've gone. We don't give anything away. Uh, we're not lazy prosecutors. Uh, I'm all for reform when it's the right thing to do to the right person at the right time. But I'm not going to categorically come up with a list of crimes I don't feel like prosecuting. I took a note to prosecute all of them. And uh, so that's not going to happen out here. And when you read about things like, yeah, do you want me to say something? Oh. So when you read about that, or you read about one of my colleagues, of whom I'm dear friends, I just have a different philosophy. Some of my county attorney colleagues have never been in a courtroom, and I've spent my whole life in one. So I have a different perspective than them. Um, and I also keep insisting that they, instead of keep worrying about how fair they are to the defendant, I keep saying, what about your victims? What about you? You mean they stole your car, smashed it, totaled it, and all you get is a postcard saying, sorry about that? No restitution, no nothing? What? Well, I, I, that's not going to happen. Now, one more quick thing. In my office, we also do civil stuff. So we protect the county on, on tax appeals. Uh, we had a big win in the Supreme Court against Walmart. As much as they take more of my time responding to all their thefts, they still don't want to pay their fair share of taxes. And my office got a landmark case against them. Uh, we've got the bus rapid transit goal line, Kevin Magnuson, uh, there he is, uh, has taken over the legal work on that's more than $500 million joint Ramsey Washington County deal. And they need somebody real, real sharp to make sure that money goes to the right place for us. And that's Kevin, and he's been doing an amazing job. Uh, so we've got a lot of different things going on. Um, our uh, certifications of juveniles, what that means is if you're 16 and you commit a violent crime, we can ask a judge to certify you to stand trial as an adult. Typically, you have to have a bunch of priors, you know, in order to say, well, this isn't a one-off. This kid's a real miscreant. We've set a record this year on a number of certifications. We don't like doing that, but if a kid insists, I'll go along with it. I mean, if the kid says, no, I, I want to do life on the installment plan, let's get started now. You know, the 18 auto thefts, the ag robberies where they never get held to account. So we've been certifying them or we do an extended juvenile jurisdiction, which means if you screw up, kid, while you're on probation, you're going to owe me for an adult felony sentence. So we've got a couple of dozen of them that we're trying to hold to account for those things like the flea and auto theft, that kind of stuff. I went too long, sorry. I wish we had all night. I'd really love to bend your ear off, but uh, um, we do need to have time for questions and answers. So, so, so with that, he's not sure I'm going to shut up. <laughs> typically, he takes the mic and ran away from me again. But I, be, before we get the the questions, um, please know that we are out here 24/7. We are here for you. Those men and women that are back behind you up against that wall, they are the life and breath of the Sheriff's Office. Let me just jump in there. And I always have an on-duty prosecutor that uh, is available to all our cops 24-7 as well. So if they get into something sticky or they don't know the legality or something, we've got somebody there. We also have two people assigned just to auto thefts. 
I have a juvenile. I always had one assigned just doing auto thefts. Now I have one in juvenile as well, and they're busier now. Thanks. So with that, let's uh, let's take questions. Yes, sir. Well, you talk about the courts are so backed up, and uh, how do how do we get the courts moving? What I do is I get on my knees and I request beg those people and say, the court administrators and some of the judges, and say, I, you know, you say you're busy, you've got these Zoom calendar things, and I said, but nothing's going away. Nothing. And this balloon is getting so big, someday it's got to burst. Someday. And so I recommend all kinds of things. Uh, like, how about night court, weekend court? I hate to do that to my staff, but I, these aren't going away, and you can't ignore them, and then they go away. But who makes the decision? The courts. It's big, them, little me when it comes to their calendars. But is it the like individual judge in Washington? No, it, 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 it would be the 10th Supreme District. Supreme Court in the state of Minnesota? Supreme Court comes up with things saying, you know, we're not going to reopen the courts now. We're going to do only Zoom. We're not going to try jury trials. And then that trickles down to each the 10 districts. Uh, court administrations. I go to judges and ask them on a personal level, if you've ever got time on your calendar, can you really open it up? I'll wear this thing all day long. I'll even put a pillowcase over my head. But let me get this case tried. And uh, what's unfortunate for me, and I've seen this a few times in my life, does it really have to get worse before it changes? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I'd hope not. I'd go, you know, don't you see it? And they go, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. We're powerless. And I accept when I'm powerless, but I don't accept it when I'm not, and I think I've got some ideas that could move these cases. I see ma'am back there. Yes, ma'am? I have two, two things that I want to bring up. The one, you said that the courts are backed up. Well, that's true. Well, I think that the courts are backed up. Are they allowing them to go back into society, or are they keeping them in jail? Oh, no, yeah, that, yeah. That, the pretrial release things, that's a good question. She said, you know, when cases are backed up and they're not getting tried for a year or two, what happens? Well, those charged with anything severe, murder, rape, they ain't going anywhere. <laughs> they're going to grind the time right there in the jail. But for everybody else, and, and what really happened was when COVID hit, it was an existential terror for us because the jails can be just a huge breeding ground for spreading COVID. So Dan's office and my office sat down and said, which one of these knuckleheads can we release and bring them in at a later date? Because they're never going to get to go to court. So we dropped our, our jail population from a couple of hundo down to about 50, 60. And we tried to keep it low there, too. Um, and we're getting much better at pretrial release conditions because a lot of judges will say, OK, well, I'm going to let you go, but I don't want you to have contact with that person. And what do they do? They leave the courthouse and go have contact with them. Uh, or I don't want you to use them drugs. They go get out. Um, we're trying to get smarter about that. We're trying to use technology like GPS. So when a judge says, I don't want you going by your ex-partner's home and harassing or stalking her, and with a GPS, we'll know if he does. And then shame on him. You know, shame on him for doing that. Do you do that um, for juveniles too? I'm sorry? Do you do that for juveniles too? Keep yeah. Yeah, we put conditional releases. It's real hard to keep a juvenile in custody. It's a, what they call JDAI, Juvenile Detention Initiative that Ramsey and Hennepin County had. If you were a kid in Ramsey County, and in short of killing President Kennedy, you ain't gonna go to jail. <laughs> um, and it, it's frustrating. They closed down Totem Town. Uh, so what's the accountability? Uh, why don't you join a basketball program at McDonough Playground? Uh, no, dude, uh, that's, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I need accountability. So those are issues. Uh, we've been working really hard with the National Institute of Corrections to come up with a better way of dealing with people other than the cash bail system, which I think is really unfair. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, she's saying, you know, given our diverse population and stuff, are there any cases? Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering, 
Can we make any conjectures? Well, one thing my friends in community corrections, they're the probation agents, they tell us that half our felonies are committed by people that don't have anything to do with Washington County. They were coming through, they come over here to do it, uh, they've come here and committed a couple of homicides recently. Uh, so half the knuckleheads I'm chasing around aren't from here, you know. And the half that are, you know, they come in every flavor, size. I, I really do view it as it gets in people's heads that they can get away with things, again, with impunity, without being held to account. They're going to go ahead and do it. And if they think, no, no, uh, I got a buddy who did it, and they really did hold them to account, they might pause and think about doing it over in Ramsey County, where I welcome them to go. Actually not, I got the relatives there too, but you know what I mean? So uh, you can't say it's this kind of kid or even this age thing. The people stealing cars seem to be 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. The word among them is there is no accountability for kids. There is no juvenile lockup. I'm changing that, I've changed it, I've got four kids sitting in Red Wing. I don't like to do it, but there's gotta be some accountability or they're gonna take my car. Well, I think you answered my question. Okay. My question was, how many hate crimes have you addressed in this county Hate crimes? Hate, hate, hate. Hate, yeah, I got it. Um, I don't recall seeing one in a while. I did the first one when that statute passed. I was an assistant Carver County attorney, and three guys beat the living daylights out of an Inuit because they thought he was Asian. And they go, you know, uh, anti-Asian thing. So I've done them, but I haven't seen them. Uh, I have gone to the mosque in Woodbury, and I've met with the imams, and Dan has too, and we tell them, look, we're here. I want the people in your, in your worship center to know we're here, we're available. And I have a very, very low tolerance for those kind of hate crimes. I had a prosecutor, he recently left me, Imran Ali. And Imran's from Boise, Idaho, but he's Pakistani American. And he's told me over and over again about what people say to him at, at Holiday Gas Station and that. Uh, the very hurtful things. But a hate crime, they're hard to prove because unless they're telling you why they're doing something to somebody, like in other words, I'm gonna kill you because you're not my favorite color or something like that, it's really hard to get that motive proved, which is frustrating, but that's just the way it is. Does that answer the question? That answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, will I take them? Yeah. I've talked to Jewish Community Resource Center in Minneapolis, Steve Hunt is a good friend. They're very concerned about anti-Semitic hate. We've seen it, we've seen the shootings at temples and that. And, and we just remind them, we're here, we're available. Like Dan keeps saying, pick up the phone, call us. Oh wait, I do have one, I do have a hate crime. It was in Forest Lake and it was a black couple uh, that were, the neighbor got drunk and went over there and threatened him with a gun and said some very naughty things to them. And we hammered on him for that. So I did have one. Yes, sir. I live in Savannah Park. And I was wondering if you could share, you know, to everybody here, you know, is there a lot of crime happening in that park that we just don't know? In which park? Savannah. Savannah. Oh, I, 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 so what, what I would say with that, it, it's nothing more than normal anywhere else. Um, I would think, uh, Years ago, I think we had a lot more thefts, a oh. lot more crimes, um, a lot of domestics in there. Um, and, and I think over the years, I think uh, um, the crime in there has went way down. Um, really, it, it's due to the citizens that live there and police themselves, etc. cetera. Um, but they do, uh, I, nothing more than anywhere else. I agree. I was I was a prosecutor here from 90 to 97, and I went on to the Attorney General's office and places. But at that time, oh, was I busy in Cimarron with the drugs and that. And since then, we've got a crime-free multi-housing project, which keeps felons and criminals out of there. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, Family Means has moved in there, and they run daycare. Uh, we had a picnic there about three years ago at Cimarron to meet the people and cook them hot dogs and hamburgers. I think it's become way more family friendly. Uh, not a lot of uh, people coming and going. People are living there. And uh, 
Uh, same thing with landfall. I, I don't see problems like I saw in the early 90s. I just don't. Other than the problems I see everywhere. Yes, sir. Uh, I hear a lot of what it should have could have coming out of everything tonight. I also note that 80% of the people that are sitting in this audience probably came here to find out and are probably in the senior citizen era and have probably come here to find out what how they can prevent themselves from being hurt. But I do not see uh, the individuals, there's a lot of homes going up by the airport, there's a lot of new homes going out behind the schools. I do not see that generation of adults with smaller children in this audience. What are we doing or what can we do to educate those parents, to educate those children, to follow the right direction, or follow a proper direction. Now, I come from an era where I guarded Martin Luther King's body, where I've seen the Selma, where I've been to Vietnam, where I've seen people just murdered out in the streets of the Philippines. I've come from that era and I have always, the reasoning being there's no accountability, I agree with you. The first time you mentioned Cimarron and having your parties, that was one of the more plus things that have occurred by Washington County. But what are we doing, and I heard you say 50%, 80% of the people coming in are not from Washington County. But what are we doing to the adults and their children that are currently living Got it. in Washington. Got it. Here's what we're doing. I can't prevent somebody from committing a crime. So I think a big part of my role as county attorney is I'm not going to sit and wait for Dan to bring the file to me so I can prosecute it. I do those. But when I'm not doing those, I've got Laura. Stand up, will you, Laura? I want everybody to know you. Laura Perkins, we just brought her in to do these kinds of things. Get us in the community. Uh, I've got an annual report I put out every year, except the last two, it's been electronic because I can't hand them out to anybody, uh, showing you how you can get a hold of a, any of us prosecutors to do a community meeting. Anytime, I've been in a number of church basements, several in Lake Elmo, after a service, talking about things like identity theft, protecting seniors from fraud, protect, like Dan did, protecting your home, all kinds of crime prevention tips, uh, holiday shopping tips, I send that out every year. Uh, so we try to reach in the community. I think we're being as proactive as I can possibly think of and not just reactive and wait for stuff to happen. We, I'd rather nip the crime in the bud before it happens than have it happen and try to undo that pain. Okay, but I agree with this woman in the back and when she mentioned because I have youngsters, grand youngsters, in the Lake Elmo system, and they belong and they attend the uh, Spanish immersion. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of minority mixed groups, mm -hmm. of which my adult children are, in the Lake Elmo area. And I believe that unless the education is given for it, we are going to develop a lot of hate crimes. We are going to develop how to hate thy neighbor. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I'll tell you this, so we look at those, uh, right there, we look at those numbers all the time, and demographically, this county has changed so unbelievably in the last 30 years. And one of the most diverse cities in the metro area happens to be Woodbury, and Cottage Grove, and Oakdale, and here, and even Stillwater. And uh, we go to those community groups some of the Hmong Americans, the uh, South Asian Americans, we meet with them. We ask to get involved. Uh, we want them to come to presentations and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I think the diversity is going so well uh, that we get very few hate crimes. We really do. Um, and I hope it stays that way because I think everybody moves out here for the same reason why we all moved out here. We want good schools and a safe place. Everybody wants that.
Community involvement, community engagement is key. There's no doubt about that, and we got to continue. Last, last year, we did over 60 engagements. The Sheriff's Office will continue to be that part and that voice in our community, bridging that gap, but reaching out to people as well. We have done that. We will continue to do that uh, as we go forward. I know, Council? Council? Lake Council members, you have three council members who are in the city's administrative care system, city administrators also here. Just to let you know that within the last five years since I've been a resident of Lake Elmo, um, I, I live in a community that is mostly 50 and above. However, I don't have a lot Okay, there you go. So, but that said, we move from that. We just recently had a, a very good community meeting here for developing a, a block club in the Savona area. We had Boulder Pond residents there. We had Lake Crossing residents there. And all of those neighborhoods are extremely diverse. And we had people from all walks of life that are participating with that. Uh, the Next Door app has been very successful in these neighborhoods to keep people informed. Sometimes it gets blown out of proportion, and we always ask everybody to check your information. In our particular uh, development, we have gone from quite a few thefts, and we had a, a, a robbery or an attempted robbery in our neighborhood. We have gone from that by doing the community watch. We've gone to a neighborhood now that is not a great target to come into because we are watching each other. Excuse me, but my point being, what are we doing at the 30, 40 age level with their children in our schools to teach them or train them in the proper direction? That's the point. And that was my question. What are we doing with that? Sure, we're all at a level of which we are concerned about our community, our well-being, our personal well-being. What are we doing from a legal standpoint in our high schools, in our grade schools, so that these children are getting this word across to them? Yeah, we don't have eight years old about, yeah, I hope, Robin and Stephen Clark. <laughs> so we, we still teach DARE in Washington County. We're still active in Lake Elmo uh, schools. We are still active for the Sheriff's Office, right, in Oakland Middle School. We're active in the Montemedi, all of the schools out there. We have a DARE officer in Hugo. We have a DARE officer up in Scandia. We continue to be involved in our schools. And it's not just the Sheriff's Office or Attorney's Office thing. It's a community uh, issue, right? We, we can't do it all alone. And so all of our nonprofit partners, um, Family Means, um, Canvas Health, um, Valley Outreach, uh, you name it. Um, I'm part of the United Way. I'm the president of uh, United Way of Washington County East. And we are very focused in giving money out to those nonprofits that do exactly that, that really look at DEI, that really uh, look at our, our youth and growing up uh, as we go. So we're, we're very active. This, this one meeting, this is just, just one. We will continue. COVID has hurt, there's no doubt about it. There's Teams and there's Zooms, but that doesn't catch everyone and we know that. And that's why we're back in person. And I, again, I thank Lake Elmo. Thank you very much for, for putting this together, having us here, because it's the discussions that we all do and that we all have to have in the training and the respect for each other as we go forward, that will make a difference in, in all ages. So, which is which is neat. Well, uh, Jeff, you. did you? I thank you for your effort very much. Thank you. I was just going to add, I'm Jeff Holtz, and I'm on council as well with um, Lisa again, and also Katrina Beckstrom as well. So, Katrina and I both live in one of the Phelps, Phelps, I was mentioned next to the airport. And we have experienced some of the same uh, criminal activity as well. I know part of my job, and I think part of all our jobs, okay, we are here physically tonight. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends what you saw, what you heard, but also let them know this recording is being online. This is being recorded. I can tell you firsthand, 
None of my neighbors could attend today because they're at sports. They're at various activities. It doesn't mean they don't care. They do. And they're depending upon, hopefully, me having a decent memory. Or posting notes somewhere, or posting a recording. Our residents are interested, so just because someone isn't here, that doesn't mean they don't care. Please, if you have neighbors, have friends who are interested, tell them what you know. Tell them what you heard. When the link hopefully gets posted on the website, spread the word. People take to digest information in different ways. Some are visual, some are listener. Thank you for those who attended, because this is helpful. But we're all going to spread the word in different ways, and as Sheriff Starry said, this is one of yeah, Councilman, thanks for that. And remember also to plug the fact that if you'd like one of us to come and speak at one of your groups, I've done it in, in a living room with a ladies' knitting group. I mean, I, I don't need an auditorium. Uh, but I, we're so focused on trying to prevent the crime that give us an opportunity to talk to you about that. So that's another option. Uh, evenings are a hard sell to get anybody out of the house. 10 times harder when we're on this coronavirus stuff, uh, and it's risky for a lot of people. But if you want, all you gotta do is call my office and say, hey, would somebody come and speak about whatever it is that is vexing you? What are we doing about kids? What are we doing about protecting seniors? Uh, all those topics really wanna get out there as soon as we're allowed socially, you know? Yeah, please. Sheriff Starry, you had mentioned, and this was new news for me, that we can call the non-emergency if we're going to be away from our homes, like vacations, things like that. Is there a minimum number of days you want us to do, you know, short-term, long-term absences from our homes? No, I think I, that's a great thing that we can do that. Yeah, we, we've been doing this for, for years, and, and um, I remember doing it as a deputy, right? I mean, we did get the list of uh, checks, and, and we would go and do that. Um, there is not. If, if you think, especially whatever's going on in the neighborhood or whatever, or if there's snowfall or whatever, please, number one, contact your neighbor also. Let them know, hey, watch my house because I'm going to, be, if you trust them, right? And, and, and hopefully the neighborhood watches, right? I mean, that's, that's why we do this, is to make sure that we know each other, correct? Um, and so if you have that, if it's three days, four days, give us a call. If it's only one day, I mean, time we get to it, probably it's not going to happen, right? Uh, you're going to be home and you're, we're going to pull up on you. But please, um, contact contact us if, if it's a long weekend, uh, et cetera, and you're going away. Especially if it could be one day if there is no one watching your house whatsoever, right? Like I said, and the non-emergency line is there. The same dispatcher will answer it if you dial 911. Same one. And we've been trying to get that message out for a really long time. Call 911 in regards to anything. Um, we also have other phone numbers. I mean, you can look them up uh, for for things too. But please uh, give us a call anytime. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, just a couple of things, real quick. Um, I appreciate that you're going after the truancy issues because I feel like education is a path to success, and I know it's so hard right now. So I do appreciate that. And then I also want to say I appreciate everything the sheriffs, the police, the all of you guys are doing. I know you're working so hard, and I, I think what it gets me so frustrating when you're doing and you're sharing these kids just get let out, or the judges give them something lenient, or the district courts get one open. So, are there things that we, as the general public, can do to? I mean, one thing I know is when it's election time, paying attention to the judges on the back side of the ballot that nobody usually does. But is there, are there other things that we as just general citizens can do to maybe, you know, get on some of these backs or legislative people or whatever just to help you guys? That's great. That is great. And yes, it is. It starts here. It starts exactly here. Uh, you meet the people who are here to try to do the best we can to keep you protected and your family. And we need to know how you're feeling. And, you know, so that we can then communicate back to our legislators, which is what Dan and I do uh, frequently. Uh, and that's, I think, how change occurs. When the people want change, change will occur. As far as education, I'm a former high school teacher. I don't think you can put enough into kids. I know this gentleman was talking about, you know, really what kind of curriculum is out there to straighten these kids out. A lot of values, clarification stuff. I'm not an educator anymore, uh, but, you know, 
I don't deal with school board stuff, but I think it starts with the community coming together and talking and then talking with us. And, uh, and that's how we can get movement. And then we talk to the state reps and the state senators and uh, some of the other powers that be. I'll, I'll say from, from our city councils to our county board, uh, to our uh, reps or legislatures, they're very open if you give them a call uh, with the concern that you may have. Um, please do that, be active. First part of, uh, of doing anything is caring, and again, I know there's people that are not here, that can't be here, but showing up tonight, I mean, really it shows that you, you care. Doesn't mean that the others don't, but you did. It's what, minus five out there tonight, right? I mean. Um, so thank you, I, I just, from my standpoint and from the Sheriff's Office standpoint, thank you for being here, thank you for listening, thank you for your support, our, our guys and, and gals, I mean, they, they truly need it. Uh, it's been a rough few years on law enforcement, and uh, so all the support, I mean, it has been overwhelming. Washington County Lake Elmo has been really supportive of law enforcement, I think we do a great job, I'm biased. Uh, but I think we really, really do a great job, and we we truly want to be there to assist you. So please call. And, I know uh, it, one thing, I, I just think Edmund Burke said it about 150 years ago. Uh, the only way evil triumphs is when good people do nothing. And uh, so I think coming out to something like this at Five Below, that's not doing nothing. I, it, there is power. So that's wonderful. Yes. I'm going to piggyback on that because good people doing something is the plug I'm going to give for Neighborhood Watch. And I'm a coordinator for Neighborhood Watch in my area. Great. And this is how we get to know we're spread out. A lot of us are spread out from one another. I can't see any of my neighbors from my house. And they're next door to me, but I have an acre lot and they're, we're all wooded, blah, blah. But I get because of Neighborhood Watch in our area, we have, we have nine, we're on the tri lakes, so we have a lot of, you know, spread out people. We are getting to know each other's kids, and people are paying attention, not just to each other and the fact that somebody might be going, but who is, who is that? So if there is a kid that we don't know, or there is a strange vehicle, you know, we're much more attuned to that, so we are more connected to one another. And that's, what, that's how we save, I'm also a retired teacher, this is how we take care of our kids. Not just our own, not just our children and grandchildren, or nieces and nephews, but the community. And we can't do that without knowing one another. And, and you all have been very supportive of the sheriff. I've worked with Darren quite a bit. We had some incidents over in our area, and we had a lot of support from you, and a lot of information right away that we can disseminate let people know what's going on and how to take care of themselves and each other. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank, if, thank if you for we that. If we can get more of our neighborhoods to get going on that and get, get that started, and it just takes a little bit of work from, uh, you know, a lot of people in the neighborhood, and you can be pretty successful. Neighbor, the Neighborhood Watch is a great way and a powerful way to get to know your neighbors. And like you said, you may have acres in between. I mean, Lake Elmo. It's spread out. We, we, we're clustered in some areas, but we're spread out in others. And it's a great way to get to know each other. And, and really, um, you're going to be talking to them a lot more if you get to know them. Right? Make I mean, an event out of it and invite one of us. Well, yeah. Not that we're a big draw, but I mean... Say that. Darren has come out along with um, our community officer from, because we border Oakdale, and he brought so we have had in our front yard during COVID people coming together for just a little happy hour visit from you guys. And we've are, I've already talked to them about setting some up for this next spring and summer. So I know you guys are willing to come out right into our yards and do this for us. So we're, that's, absolutely, that's we're 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 very accessible. Give us a call. We'll be there to like Pete said. If you want us there, we'll be there. Um, we have a great crime prevention uh, crew that's running right out of our patrol. Every area's got, got their officer or their deputy. 
and I think we do a really, really good job. I'm very proud of that, so thank you for that. we got to get out of here, but I know you have a question. Uh, just one about uh, gangs. Are any of these crimes uh, caused by gangs and where these kids have to each other? Uh, she asked about gangs. I've got a fair amount of experience in gangs. I was a uh, legal director for the Minnesota State Gang Strike Force for five years run out of the Attorney General's office, different from the Metro one. Uh, we were one of the first counties to have a gang investigation and prosecution unit, uh, which was set up in the early 90s. I've got a great deal of experience working with gangs, but we haven't been seeing that. What we've been seeing, at least recently with the thefts, the auto thefts and that, uh, it's a group, 40 to 50 young people, that communicate, again, socially, so it's not, they don't have a clubhouse or any of that, but they send each other all kinds of stuff. And we've kind of, those of us in law enforcement know that a good number of them are the ones who are out doing this because we're tracking their social media as well. So I don't see much gang activity. When I do, uh, I let the gang know that I got a badder gang than they do, that my gang is much tougher than their gang. We better get you guys out of here. We promised seven, and we've already taken up too much of your time. Are you going to broadcast this on the station? Yes, Probably I will. Yeah, this is the city's website. This, the city's website. Oh, okay. And, and the public access channel, if you have cable. Cable channel 16. And do we have a date when that will happen so we can get that out to the neighboring lot? Uh, we'll try and get it out by tomorrow afternoon. Oh. I want to thank the city, our city council people. I want to thank our school folks. I really want to thank you. I haven't had a live audience in almost two years, and I'm getting real lonely. So <laughs> as soon as this is over, I think I really want us to get together more. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.